So this is a, a really serious topic and one of the most important topics facing the country and the planet right yeah, now. I agree. What did you find about income inequality? Is it a necessary evil to have inequality so that, you know, that that, that, that tension on some level causes people to strive? Or do you think that that's a load of bullock? Well, everyone can't automatically be middle class. But what you do hope that there is empathy that exists within that that degree of the population that they want to help, they want to give back, and that's what we found in the show. You know, we take you, uh, you know, f you know, to where we're volunteering with people who are struggling to to get their bills paid, to you know, a one percenter who races Ferraris for a hobby. Like that's what he does on weekends. That's not a bad hobby. That is not a bad <laughs> yeah. hobby. Yeah. yeah. Wow. All right. Thank you. Thanks, sir. I'm in New Orleans, Louisiana. Around here, rich and poor live side by side, yet the gap between them is widening by the day. I've been working with Total Community Action, a nonprofit that connects low-income families with much-needed assistance. But in order to really understand the problem of income inequality and maybe find a way to help make a dent, I also need to get inside the 1%. Wealthy Americans haven't made so much more than everyone else since the Roaring Twenties. Less than two miles away from TCA, there's a very different world, St. Charles Avenue. How are you? Morgan, how good are to you? See you? Good, very good pleasure, to see you. pleasure to meet you. Thank very you for nice having me. Nice to meet you as well. Thank you. Come on. John Hotaling is a high-powered attorney and entrepreneur in New Orleans who has raked in hundreds of millions of dollars over the course of his career. Your house is amazing. Oh, thank you. This place was built by the Cotton King of New Orleans. Wow. This was a wedding present to his wife. Your, your kitchen's bigger than my apartment. Oh, yeah, it's a, it's a working kitchen. <laughs> What's like the monthly cost to run the house? It's, it's a lot, you know. It's more than I made my first year as a lawyer. <laughs> what did you think the first time you guys met? I thought, I wasn't oh. Depressed. As I later found out, she's from Moscow. And she's this big Russian pop star. <laughs> and this is kind of normal. This is, this is her normal life. Yeah. What did you think the first time you came to this house? I was confused. You were confused? <laughs> because, of, because of how big it is? Yeah, I didn't even know where my room was. Right. Wow. The bed belonged to Marie Antoinette. No way. Yeah, that's Like true. it was actually Marie Antoinette's bed? Yeah. That is... It's amazing. I remember the first time that I wrote myself a check for a million dollars. And I thought, that's the American dream. Yeah. But you get there, and you have a dream, and you have ambition. You have a drive. That drive doesn't go away. You know, what I thought rich before is different than what I think rich is now. So what's rich to you today? If I was a billionaire, that's rich. Yeah. It's like Monopoly. You know, you, you don't get to a point in Monopoly where you win. You just keep going. And when John says he keeps going, sometimes it's in one of his custom-built race cars. That's right. While some people find time to hit the gym in the morning, John hits the racetracks. Well, what I like about this, it's hard to concentrate on anything else. Can't worry about work. Can't worry about the problems. You concentrate just on this. So when you were in a good groove yeah. and going fast is that your talent would get you beyond the, the rich guy in the Ferrari and passing. Yeah. That was always great. I like the underdog. I don't think you're the underdog anymore. Well, I sued Walmart one time and let me tell you, you felt like the underdog. It's all relative, my friend. The more money you have, the more likely you are to achieve it. Take John Hotaling, for example, the millionaire attorney. His money affords him the opportunity to take huge risks that might lead to even greater profits and, in turn, greater opportunities. But there's a reason John seems to empathize with the 99%. He used to be one of them. When I was born, um, my father made $1,500 this whole, the whole year. So he made, like, just over $100 a month. Yep. You know, my, my mother and father tell a story about being on food assistance. And it was really hard waiting in a waiting room for food assistance. The lie that people have told the middle class is that people are poor because it's easier to be poor. It's not easy being poor. Yeah. It's much less work to have a good job 
than to have to live that kind of a life. Right. They worked and they clawed their way up and they got out of it. But I understand how incredibly lucky yeah. because there's a lot of people that work really hard that don't give those, that don't get those breaks. Yeah. If we don't have safety nets for hardworking people who can't get a break, yeah. then I think that ultimately comes back to us. I think it ultimately comes back to us on us not having an educated American public. I think it ultimately comes back to us in having a sick American public. Uh, I think it comes back into people that don't have the options that I had and turn to crime or in desperation turn to other things. Yeah. What the rich need to understand is that what is good for me is sometimes also what's good for my neighbor. Your wealthy friends must think you're crazy. Most of them do. Why would you want to vote for a party that wanted to raise your taxes? Although one percenters like John may be few and far between, he's not alone. John is a walking, or rather race car driving paradox. Though he's part of the 1%, he made his millions representing the 99% as a victim's rights attorney. He has collected millions of dollars from insurance companies on behalf of victims of Hurricanes Katrina, Ike, and Sandy, and runs the same law firm credited with taking down Big Tobacco. But John is also an entrepreneur, always looking for the next big profitable opportunity. Recently, he has partnered with several other one percenters who are investing several billion dollars in an oil and gas project in Louisiana. How do you get to the point um, as an incredibly successful lawyer where you say, well, now I'm going to do oil and gas? It happened organically. I was working with entrepreneurs um, in that industry uh, as a lawyer. And then after a while, I learned how they did it and said, you know what, maybe I can do it. But it's a risk. You're putting out your money, you're putting out your time in the hope it's going to work. Yeah. It may not. You know, there's things that work and there's things that don't. But that's the thing about getting ahead. It requires taking the risk that might work or might fail. And failing is a luxury that many of us simply can't afford. For John, taking a risk with his new oil and gas venture may be the thing that pushes him into that billionaire status. So we're taking to the skies to check on the site for his new project. You have to understand what is an opportunity. Yeah. What's a door that is open for you? You got to understand when, OK, right here is an opportunity for me to improve. I have to say that from all the way up here, it's easy to forget that for many down there, those opportunities are becoming more and more rare. Well, that was pretty awesome. He's used to it. Just another Friday for him, for me, pretty awesome. In all honesty, I'm enjoying myself. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. Cheers. In one day with John, I'm getting to do things that most people don't get to do in an entire lifetime. And tonight, John is introducing me to some of his influential social set, including businessmen, colleagues, even a Grammy award-winning musician. But I still have to ask, when is enough enough? And in the presence of so much lavish success, wouldn't just a little bit of sharing go a very long way for the people I've been getting to know across town? Let's eat. Well, Morgan, uh, welcome to New Orleans. Mm. Cheers. Cheers. You've been in New Orleans for a couple days now? I have. It's been amazing. I've been working at a place called Total Community Action. Uh, you know, from their, from their food pantry to their job services to, you know, people who suddenly the, it got cold. You know, suddenly it was freezing here for like the last month. And then their electric yeah. bill went from like $85 to $400. And so these people can come get help. And it's, it's a remarkable place. Yeah. We're, we're trained to think that if you work hard, if you do the right things, you too can have it. I think that's not true. You have to have certain breaks. You have to have certain opportunities. You have to have certain environment. And that becomes a challenge, yeah. I think. We live under this fallacy of liberty and justice for all. And if you just pull yourself by your bootstraps, it'll all be OK. But that presumes we all start at the same starting line. Uh, in your car races, if you're in a different heat from you, right, we, we, we adjust your times and we make it so that everybody can golf. I love golf, okay? Yeah. So you we get play a, handicap. On a handicap system. In this country, we, we have gotten away from that and, and that's no longer popular. And we've gone back to, ah, forget about all that, everybody just run their own race. And all of a sudden, the disparity that existed that we were trying to equalize is now spread apart again. Listen, I, I spent the morning with a single mom 
who works hard every day mm -hmm. and is making 500 bucks every two weeks. Mm -hmm. So where's the opportunity for her to kind of get beyond where she is? We've allowed money to hijack the debate. The, the debate, the conversation, is no longer dominated by the majority. It's dominated by whoever has the majority of money. That's exactly right. When you reach a certain level of financial success or, or financial accomplishment in your life, do you have an obligation to do more, to Thousands. give back? Absolutely. Thousand percent. TCA for a perfect example is like, that is a place that it doesn't need a lot of money to make a difference within that organization. And that money goes a long way. They got 300 people that work for that organization. You should do a fundraiser for them. He should have a fundraiser for TCA. That's what I just told him. That's a good idea. Awesome. Okay. Cheers. To the fundraiser. Cheers. Cheers, yeah, guys. Yeah. It's been an eye-opening week for me in New Orleans. I'm beginning to really understand what it means to live at both ends of the economic spectrum. And tonight, I'm returning to John Hotelling's home for the fundraiser week plan. We're throwing an auction with all the proceeds going to TCA. There it is. Whoa. Oh my gosh. Wow. The retail for this one is $25,000. $25,000. Absolutely. Wow. Franco brought some earrings. Having known John and uh, this kind of circle friends for a while, he predicts 15 to 20 grand that we'll be able to auction that all for tonight. So. That'd be amazing. Now he's got to like ply people with lots of booze. I have a goal in mind of how much money we should raise. TCA's president, Thelma French, told me the largest private donation they ever got was $1,000. So hopefully tonight, we'll be able to raise much more than that. Everybody, can we have your attention, please? No, thank you, all of you, for coming. I was called not too long ago, and I met uh, Morgan Spurlock. He's been spending some days in New Orleans, and he's been talking uh, to different people in the city about it. what does it take to make it? What are the things that stand in your way? And we decided that we would have uh, some friends over to talk about this. So while, while we were actually having dinner the other night, as we were talking about you know, people making a difference, people giving back, was when I, I, I basically conned him and suckered him into having this benefit here tonight. I said, uh, I said, if we really want to try and do something, why don't we try and raise some money for TCA? Why don't we try and help the folks there? This year, they are celebrating their 50th anniversary. There are about 62,000 people in New Orleans that go through the doors of TCA every year. It is an incredible place that has had such a huge impact. And the people, even the people who work there, are remarkable. So tonight, we can start to chip away and, and give them a chance. So with the help of Franco, who's here tonight, he has been so generous to donate a pair of earrings tonight. Let's see them. The lovely Lauren is gonna bring them up. Very nice piece of jewelry. Re retail, $25,000. Let me just add one more thing. The largest donation that they've ever got from a private individual was $1,000. There, we're starting with a thousand. He's Judy. Okay, who gives me two thousand? Two thousand. Who's got two thousand? He's got five. Bless you, man. He's got five. You're be a thousand years old. Who else? Eight thousand. We got eight thousand. Eight thousand. Who's going ten? Ten thousand. Joe Bruno's got ten thousand. Who's got twelve? Who's got twelve thousand? I love my wife. It is twelve thousand. You men should feel terrible. Joe's going 14, 14 How about 15,000? John's going 15,000. I love my wife the most, apparently. <laughs> 17,000. You're still saving money. 18,5. 18,5. 18, 18,5 going once. 18,5 going twice. Sold to our amazing host. Let's hear it for John. One more thing. As I said, the largest donation was $1,000. Who in this room would be willing to donate $1,000 right now right to here. help this charity? Raise your hand. Right here, come on. There's One more, let's there's make a, 10. There's One the 9,000. There's 10, oh, there's 10, there's oh, another 10. There's he's 10, back in the building. There's 10. Who'll commit to 500? We got three? That's right, there's another 1,500. <laughs> now I'm gonna make it easy for everybody. Now I'm gonna make it easy. Everybody else who hasn't raised your hand, 
Who will give $100? 13, 14, 15. There we go. So we got another 15. Fantastic, guys. Thank you. Give yourselves a round of applause. Five and a half. Yay! <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, give it up for Grammy Award winning Urban Mayfield, ladies and gentlemen. Make some noise. <laughs> It was a pretty amazing night. We raised $31,000, which at the end of the day isn't gonna change everything at TCA, but it will start to at least, at least lessen the burden. So I can't wait to go give Miss French a check for $31,000, which is like 31 times the largest check she's ever gotten. You gotta begin somewhere. And I think ultimately, beginning from a place where you say, it's not all about me, but what can I do? What can I do to help someone is the next step.